So I wear two hats. I work for SBM Management. We are a custodial company that does business with a lot of your Fortune 500 companies. And I had the fortune of starting recycling back in 1993 at the HP site in Roseville, California. Uh, in addition to that, I wear a different hat, which is the chair of the now GBCI Zero Waste Program, which used to be the United States Green Building Council Program. And so um, we're really trying to help people learn about, more about zero waste, become a certified professional around zero waste, and also be able to certify facilities as a third party vendor coming out and actually eliminating the greenwashing issues, et cetera. So I'm here to talk about the power of the triple bottom line. And what is sustainability? And there's so many definitions and so many people's opinions, but I, I like this one best, which is meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And I always think about my grandkids, and they're very small, and we're teaching them right that they've got to recycle and do all of the right things and not generate trash, and they donate their toys before they've broken them to pieces, and all of those things, but it's really looking to the future. And then it's looking at the triple bottom line. And it's really looking at the accounting that expands the traditional reporting besides just tracking your diversion and tracking your dollars to include the different parts of this framework to take on accounts, account social environmental performance in addition to financial performance. And it's always, you know, especially in the business world, they're always looking at the bottom line. So how do we get them to expand that? And I think we're seeing a lot of good changes in that realm. This is just some highlights of um, myself and what we've been doing. We handled almost 43 million pounds of material last year for our customers, diverting on average seven, almost 78%. Um, it's interesting, I had this up to 89% and we brought in a new customer that had just started working on recycling, so it just went whoop. But we're working on that. So what does the triple bottom line mean? I'm going to ask some questions. What is your priority? So by a show of hands, your priority, is it business, personal, or global? So first one is business. How many of you are about the business? A few of you. How many of this is personal? Much better. And then global. OK, very good. So then it's, it's putting on your business hat. Which one is your priority? Is it profit? Show of hands. Different group in the room. <laughs> Planet. OK, and then people. OK. So you guys are seeing the, the, the need to have the planet and the people together so that you can get the changes that you want. Um, today, best in class really means best for the planet, the people, as well as the profit. So how does the triple bottom line affect you, and what are the stories from the triple bottom line? So most businesses, and that's the world I come from, look at profit. They're looking at their cost versus their savings and sustainability and diversion and recycling and upstream and downstream. They're looking at partnerships with their suppliers and their vendors. Years ago, you didn't look at partnership. You wanted to beat every single penny you could out of them. And then what happened is they usually failed, and then you were looking for another resource. So I think the, the learning there is that partnership. It's establishing what your corporate goals are and then looking at upcycle. And upcycle really is looking at let's not buy it, let's not purchase it, let's not warehouse it. Let's really look at, and then, how do I train my employees and get leadership involved? The planet is your corporate goals around diversion and greenhouse gas. And then, of course, the three R's. And we know that there's many, many more R's than the three. But those are your starting point. And then the last part of this is people. And it's looking at retention and hiring the best and the brightest. And I think a lot of businesses are starting to see that they're missing out on great young talent and old talent, getting there. Um, that helps us learn and prosper and get the right people in the right positions, and this really helps. And then it's looking at 
culture change and motivating people to work at what they, they love and do what they love, as well as personal values that align with the corporate goals, and then facilitating change. So you want to first identify your, your prog program objectives. And I have six here that start, start with encourage participation, look at what your goals are, achieve cost savings, and improve your recycling. Reduce recycling and trash that's going in. So you've got trash going in recycle and recycle going into trash. We want to eliminate contamination. Raise staff awareness. We're getting back to the people part of things. And then look at compliance. We like to use a timeline. Where do I start? Where do I end? How do I recirculate this? So you start out developing your baseline. That's your profit center. So we, you develop your baseline. What's your profit? So you're looking at how do I establish profit? How do I make this work? How to make this cost effective? The next step is conducting a waste analysis. Why a waste analysis? Primarily because you need to see what's going into your trash. And that even comes from the nine points of generation of where in your business are you generating that trash? Is it contaminated with your recycle contaminated with trash? Then you're looking at gaps in your program. Do you have the right vendors? Are they, are they setting you up to be successful? Are you setting them up to be a zero waste company besides yourself? From there, you're gonna look at your people. How do you implement the programs? How do you improve the programs? How do you stretch that education that everybody gets involved? You want to track your data, that's profit as well as plan it. You're going to review your progress and then keep reevaluating and just keep that cycle going so that you're constantly improving. So I want to talk about profit. And I've got some numbers here. You don't need to look at all the detail, but somebody handed me a, a bill and they said, hey, it seems like it's really crazy. I'm, I'm paying too much. Well, their compactor will hold five tons. And if you look at this list of numbers here, you don't see five tons anywhere on there. They're not maximizing their loads. So I did some math and said, okay, you got 32 tons. You had 13 pickups. You literally could go and cut that in half. Now, you're still going to have to pay the cost per ton. It exists. But you don't have to pay for all those haul fees. On top of all those haul fees is all those trucks running around, wear and tear, greenhouse gases. But you've got to look at how you can make this profitable, how you can cut down on cost. So I created, um, I've got two different views that I, li I like to look at. If I landfilled everything, what would the cost be? So in a simple model here, and this is a real model, so they were paying $6 million to have the trash collected. That's your janitors going through your building collecting the trash. They were paying $4 million for their haul fees and their tip fees, so ultimately they paid $10 million. But instead in this version that we've got going, they still paid that $6 million, but we then adjusted the staff so that they were handling the recycling, no additional cost. Now, there was an additional cost of $2.4 million that included labor for processing, bailing material, sorting material, as well as equipment and supplies. And then we had a revenue stream, $4.2 million. We started selling our material so that we could make revenue on it. So that's the most important part. Can I sell it? Can I package it? Can I hold on to it long enough to make this cost effective? Sometimes you can't. Most of the times, I think you can. In addition to that, we started a reuse program. So instead of buying truckloads of, of pallets, we started reusing all the existing pallets instead of putting them on the truck so the guy could take them to his plant, sort them, and put them back on his truck, and then resell them to us. And then on top of that, we had avoided landfill costs. So you've got to make sure that you're including all of these parts and pieces in your story. So they still paid $4.2 million, but they saved $5.8 million, and they hit 90.8% diversion. Yes, it took some time to do this, but you've got to, you're running a business. Now, this is some older numbers, and I kept this intentionally because it's, usually there's a sweet spot, right? You hit 80% or so, and then you're cost effective. This proves that that's not a true statement. This proves that you can see the diversion in the small orange dots, but the blue is the diversion going up and down, and the green is the money. We've got to follow the money. And in the early years of this program, we weren't getting paid much for our material, but we weren't paying the trash bills either. So it's how you balance this, how you look at it, and you're running a business. So let's look at people. So how do you inspire people to change what they're doing and how they're running your business? And everything that we do with these people makes an impact on our entire world. Um, and we've got a lot of upheaval in our world right now. And um, anyway, not going there. 70%... <laughs> 
it's just too depressing. But anyway, 70% of all employees are engaged at their work. They're engaged in the business of doing their work, and we want them to start looking beyond that. We want to change the direction of this communication. We want to inspire people to take a positive action and prove that being a force for good is really good for business. So I borrowed these from Clean River Containers, and we, I think we all start this way. I need to get the collection program in place. I have to communicate what I want to achieve, and then I've got to change the culture. Is that working for us? Not really. So then we're going to add zero waste to the equation. We're going to get there. So working with, with Clean River, and, and Bruce is the owner, and he's, just, he's extremely brilliant at this stuff. He says, we've got to stop. We've got to stop. OK, I'm going to buy containers. No, we've got to change the culture. We've got to get people involved and want them to do well. We're going to communicate it next, and then we're going to bring the containers in with some wonderful signage and some great pictures and getting people involved because we want our employees to sort of enjoy this work and learn from it and see that they're making a difference. Along with working with people, and this is from Recycle Across America, we really need to work on trying to create that standard in colors. We don't have it quite yet, but it's my mission in the world to, to change this so that you've got recycling is blue, trash is either black or gray, compost is green. I don't know where we get some of these colors to put compost in, but if I was the one putting the stuff in, I would not understand what they people were doing. So I'm really trying to work on that. Looking at standardization, um, I work in a lot of high-end businesses, and these, don't, these pictures don't show um, backboards, but there's also backboards that you can put on here for color. But we really worked with our clients. So when we were working on the culture, we said, we want to put something on your walls. Nobody's putting anything on our walls. You'll notice there's things on the walls. And what we agreed to is a very professional, very level, um, they're plexiglass so that I can change the message out about every six weeks. Because if it's sitting out, they usually blend and they, they get really old and you, nobody notices anything once it's been up there about six weeks. So we're constantly changing that message. And it helps us. This location probably went from about 25%. Within a year, we were at about 67. So it's a good change. It still needs more. But... Then you want to work on, on, now, we've done a lot of surveys with employees. And with that, it is looking at what do they want to hear? How do they want to hear it? They want to hear face-to-face -face from us what we're trying to achieve. They don't want emails. They get buried in everything that we do uh, for all of us. So how do we teach them? How do we incorporate? As well as putting things in the orientation packets. And it's not just the employees that are being hired. You've got to look at contractors and consultants and construction people. Everyone needs to be involved. This is a game of putt-putt, but we're using miniature um, mini bins up here. So that they'd say, OK, pick, and they'd have recycle. And we should have done it from the other side, because it says recycle, compost, and trash, and you're trying to hit the right spot. Look at your messaging. We do this in a pantry, keep it very high level, but change them out regularly. So with people, we want to look at measuring results, having visual inspections, looking at our auditing tools. As a custodian company, using reminder cards to see what's still going in the trash and leaving a nice little note. I used to give them candy kisses so that it sort of sweetened the deal a little bit. Really quickly, I'm going to look at the planet. We want to look at the EPA war model. I don't think we use this enough, and it's a great tool. Tons diverted, tons avoided, tons reduced, tons reused. Get creative, include your grass clippings, concentrated chemicals. I don't know how many of you guys are working with your vendors, but that is a great, great way to save on all the boxes and all the different parts that are involved. This is just an example of the WARM model. So what are the next steps? Create your balance on the triple bottom line. Look at each instance and try and figure out what is best for your organization. Measure your results and share your results. And then know every one of us makes a difference. Every single day that we do something different, I didn't pick up uh, servery things because I carry mine with me. I'm trying not to pick up napkins unless I know I'm going to use two, then I take two. I don't take four. We've got to all make that difference that we want to make. So thank you very much.